deployed, the last thing anybody wants to worry about when in the aviation field is, well, an ELT. I mean, let's face it, it's one of those things that gets tucked in the back and we never want to have to worry about it until we have to worry about it. There's been some changes in the ELT game lately. First of all, if you can, bring us up to date on what's happening with ELT technologies. Okay. Well, actually, the ELT technology that we use right now isn't that old, isn't that uh, new, actually, because um, it started about 10 years ago when SARSAT made the decision to turn off the repeaters for 121.5. They set a deadline of February 1st, 2009, which of course is coming on. And uh, now each country is making a decision whether or not they want to implement it on a mandatory level or if they want to make it optional. And of course in the United States we've made it optional, although a lot of people are choosing to go with 406 because of the safety behind it, because now that the repeaters are off, the 121.5 ELTs are no longer really a viable search and rescue option. Well, what are the CANED solutions right now for uh, an ELT program? Well, we have an option ver pretty much for any aircraft manufactured, whether it be a small experimental, all the way up to commercial aviation, air transport, helicopters, pretty much every, every variation. We've got the 406 AF, which is a full-size ELT that's certified f for high-speed through uh, electrostatic discharge and electromagnetic impulse testing, all the way down to our newest model, the AF Compact, which is designed specifically for single and twin engines under 350 knots. Cirrus Design's Vision SJ50 single engine personal jet offers exceptional fuel efficiency, flexible seating for up to seven, advanced avionics, and all the Cirrus safety features you expect, including the Cirrus airframe parachute system, with its detailed design, the Cirrus Vision is technologically advanced, yet engineered to be simple to fly, to allow owner pilots more lifestyle pursuits than any other personal aircraft. Learn more about the Vision SJ50 at CirrusDesign.com. One of the important things for the people should realize is that almost every single company makes an ELT in the $1,000 price range, we'll say, for general aviation specifically. Uh, but the amount of cost for installation will frequently exceed the cost of the equipment. And how much a person is going to pay for installation is the big difference between brands. For example, uh, some models of ELTs out there require aircraft power to operate the remote switch. Uh, that's labor cost. And in some and pressurized aircraft, that's also going to be a DER fee because you've just pra passed through the pressure vessel. All can add products from many years back are all self-contained, self-powered, require no aircraft power whatsoever. In fact, more, um, many, many of my customers tell me that it's 40 to 60 percent less labor to install a Canad versus other brands. Well, let's talk about uh, simple things. For start with uh, GA. Um, I fly a Cirrus uh, SR22. I own a Glass Air 3, an experimental. What should I be looking for in an ELT, and what kind of solutions might you present? Well, uh, you'd be looking for some, uh, the lowest cost unit you can buy that'll fit the speed of the aircraft. So, and that's usually the decision f factor is how fast does my aircraft go and what type of antenna do I need? Because the antenna the price is going to be variable where the ELT price won't. So, for example, on an aircraft like that, if you're under 250 knots, you could select the wire whip antenna. That antenna is under $100. Uh, if you had to go over 250 knots, you might select the fiberglass rod antenna which is going to be about $400. So you can see a dramatic increase right there. We've designed our compact ELT to work with both of those styles of antenna. So that what's, that's what makes it available for any aircraft up to 350. On that particular model, you'd want to buy something that's reasonably priced. It has good value to it. The uh, maintenance cost of the unit over time is uh, low. And something that's field serviceable so that you don't have to send it back to the factory every time the battery has to be replaced. Welcome to the Aero News Network, the aviation world's most comprehensive news and information resource. Real-time, 24-7 online audio and video programming, where aviation has been getting updated for over a decade. Distributing over 11,000 stories, features, audio and video programs every year. Only ANN covers aviation and aerospace with this much depth, insight and expertise. Check us out on the web at aero-news.net. One of the things I've noticed in the last few years, when I started in aviation, uh, ELTs were something that, oh, damn, it's gone off again. Uh, the reliability of uh, inadvertent activations has, gone, uh, has uh, 
increased dramatically. What are some of the other technological uh, issues that have come to fore in the last few years to make them not only more reliable or sight unseen until it's absolutely necessary? Mm -hmm. Well, one of the things is an improvement in the way we activate the LT. The old terminology G-switch really isn't that accurate anymore, even though we still use it as a common name, because the old G-switches were much more of a, uh, in many cases, a sliding mass that would activate a switch. Those were prone to, to errors, such mm -hmm. as freezing up from corrosion and things like that. Now we're using an electronic decelerometer and a microprocessor that device measures the amount of time the deceleration took place and it can actually adjust the amount of G's required to activate depending on the circumstances. For example, a very, very hard landing but that only lasted a couple of milliseconds might take as many as 25 G's to activate the ELT. Mm -hmm. So you see we've eliminated a lot of the false alarms. But on the other side, let's say you go down into the brush and you don't really ever have a really abrupt stop. Um, if it's measured over a period of 30 milliseconds or more, the ELT uh, microprocessor can drive the G requirements down to as low as two. Okay. So now it knows the difference between a soft crash and a hard landing. In other words, they got smart. Absolutely, they got smart. Well, fascinating. Boy, we, we do appreciate your time, and we'll look forward to seeing what else comes up down the line from uh, Canad. Thank you. Yeah, my pleasure.